our first speaker, and it is Kelsey Mulherin. And Kelsey was enrolled in my um, WMS 360 Fall 2012 Sex and Culture class. And Kelsey is majoring in health science and uh, a minor in women and gender studies. She selected Planned Parenthood and Reproductive Freedom as a topic to look at in my course because it joined both of her disciplines. Kelsey was very interested in this topic of women's reproductive health and was particularly drawn to examining ways Planned Parenthood is politicized as a health care provider. Kelsey Walk works in the Office of Career Services and she's a junior, so she's going to be with us one more year. Maybe we'll see you at Scholars Day next year. Kelsey. Hi, everyone. As Barb said, my presentation today is on Planned Parenthood and Reproductive Freedom. So first I want to introduce my thesis. about Planned Parenthood's role, service, and function as an organization. So for those of you who don't know, reproductive rights can be based on this definition provided by the World Health Organization, essentially saying reproductive rights rest on the recognition of the basic right of all couples and individuals to decide freely and responsibly the number, spacing, and timing of their children and to have the information and means to do so, and the right to attain the highest standard of sexual and reproductive health. Now, reproductive rights can include any of these things, such as access to birth control, access to sexual education, which is both medically accurate and up-to-date, safe and legal abortion, HIV, AIDS, and STI screening and treatment, freedom from coerced sterilization, freedom to make pregnancy-based decisions, and protection from gender-based practices such as female genital mutilation. Now, Planned Parenthood is an organization that works both directly in the United States and globally in order to provide reproductive rights to all individuals and couples. And this chart is showing the percentages of services that Planned Parenthood provides. Often, Planned Parenthood gets this stigma that it is an abortion clinic, that they perform so many abortions each year that you see all over the media. But as you can see here, abortion services only count for 3% of their total services. 97% of their services account for prevention methods, such as sexually transmitted diseases and infections testing and treatment at 38%, contraception 33%, followed by cancer screening and prevention at 14.5%, and then other women's health services. Planned Parenthood services include all of these things, STD and STI testing and treatment at 41%, can include things like STI tests, um, HIV tests, HPV vaccinations. Contraception methods at 32% can account for reversible contraception methods for women, vasectomies. Cancer screening and prevention counts for 12%, which can include HPV vaccinations, breast examinations, colonoscopies. Other women's health services at 11% can account for prenatal services and pregnancy tests. Abortion services, the second lowest at 3%. And then other services can include adoption referrals, family planning, or urinary tract infection um, services for women. So what are these numbers telling us about Planned Parenthood? Well, in 2011, 11 million medical services were given to 3 million people. 486,000 unintended pregnancies and five million worldwide provided with means to make responsible choices about their sexual and reproductive health. Continuing on, reproductive rights also gets um, this, well Planned Parenthood also gets this stigma that we're placing Planned Parenthoods in inner cities. Um, there's you know, myths about sterilization of certain demographics that live there, which isn't true. As you can see here, 78% of their clients have incomes at below the 150% of the federal poverty line. Therefore, if low income people are their clients, they would definitely place Planned Parenthoods where those people are living. In 2011, there were 750 health centers operated by 73 affiliates in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. 
And from a global standpoint, they served more than 1 million individuals in 10 developing countries. This is very beneficial for Planned Parenthood to do because most of the women in these countries live in rural areas. They do not have this access to health services that some people in the United States may have. So by going into these countries and putting these services to these individuals, they're giving them these rights that they might not have had access to before. So from a global standpoint, I want to bring into the global gag rule. This was a rule that was put in place that essentially denied any foreign organizations receiving U.S. family planning assistance the right to use non-U.S. funds to provide information, referrals, or services for legal abortion or advocate for the legal legalization of abortion in their country. So the global gag rule, in other words, um, took away this um, assistance that these organizations were providing all these other services to these individuals and just because they may have performed an abortion, maybe gave in a referral about abortion, they took away all these other services that they were providing to these women. So I wanna bring in the global gag rule timeline because it really reflects the inconsistency of the United States. It's kind of like a roller coaster. It's going back and forth by imposing the rule and reinstating it and imposing it again. And this has caused a lot of turmoil and has had a lot of negative effects and created obstacles for these organizations in other countries because they are in fear of actually keeping their services open to individuals because they're afraid that their funding is going to, and their assistance is going to be taken away again. So as you can see here, 1984 is first imposed by the Reagan administration. It was then reinstated by President Clinton in 1993, reinstated by George W. Bush in 2001, and then again turned over by President Obama in 2009. You can tell it's about an eight to 10 year range in here, so can you imagine what's gonna happen about eight to 10 years from now? Um, it's putting these organizations in fear, along with people in the United States in fear um, of whether these reproductive rights are gonna be taken away from them. So overall, the effects of the global gag rule um, were not all positive, mostly negative actually. Um, even though it did exempt cases of rape, incest, or life of the mother, it didn't take into consideration the mental health or physical health of the mother. It restricted the basic right to speech and the right to make informed um, decisions on health practices. It harmed the health and the lives of the poor women by making it more difficult for them to access family planning in these areas. And overall, statistically, it ended up resulting in more unwanted pregnancies, more unsafe abortions, and more deaths of women. So why Planned Parenthood? Why should we support organizations such as Planned Parenthood? Overall, Planned Parenthood definitely supports all reproductive rights of women, but it also is doing this for women in diverse backgrounds as well, not only the United States. So as you can see here, it provided women of diverse backgrounds um, access to reproductive rights. It ensured women are healthy, both physically and emotionally. And it ensured that women could make decisions about their bodies and sexuality. Also, it encouraged the most up-to-date, medically accurate, and comprehensive sex education. So to put this into perspective, in 2011, advocates and volunteer educators of Planned Parenthood would go into different schools and organizations and administer programs on sex education that was most up to date and medically accurate. And that targeted one million people. So I think this is very important because we also have you know, things in media that are telling us it, false information and not medically accurate information about sex education and by Planned Parenthood going to these places and providing these programs, it is providing this accurate sex education, not only to people in the United States, but people in other countries. So overall, reproductive rights is something that I think is not only a problem of women that we should be based, that we should focus on, but it's a problem of everyone and that we should take a lot of consideration on who we are voting for and who we um, agree with when it comes to politics because of things such as the global gag rule that denies all these reproductive rights. And we want to make sure that we're supporting people that support reproductive rights for women. Does anyone have any questions or comments?
information than it does so much more. And it's just a really tiny, tiny percentage of the services that it provides. It's very frustrating from not only you know, a health standpoint. As a health science major, I'm very interested in prevention and promotion. And from a women's um, studies standpoint, it's very frustrating because there's so many people that are going without these services. And when it comes to whether or not a woman wants to go to, you know, Planned Parenthood to get a cancer screening, people don't stigmatize it. And, oh, okay, well, she's going to get cancer screening and she might not have medical services available to her, so she's going there. And it's not frowned upon, but when someone goes there to, you know, get an abortion, it's stigmatized and it's very frustrating because, you know, it's only 3%. All that 97% is to other things. And if we were to get rid of the funding to those organizations, such as Planned Parenthood, you're getting rid of 97% of other services that are provided to these women and children and men, actually, that go there. And once you take that away, these organizations will then close and then you won't have those services. And overall, from a health standpoint, you're gonna create more illnesses and diseases overall. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I know that um, from a town that actually has, like it's a small local mm -hmm. community, but they, they do have um, Planned Parenthood, and because of the negative connotation with the abortion, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't utilize it, but they don't have a lot of you know, health care or mm -hmm. medical ability to sort yep. of get that, those types of services, so they pass up the opportunity that of all the other services that mm -hmm. they offer because of that 3%. Exactly, yeah. and I think by debunking those <laughs> myths, you'll understand all the other services that they provide. I mean, when it comes down to it, are you, if you don't have insurance, are you going to go to a Planned Parenthood and you know, have cancer treatment or screening, or are you just gonna go without it and potentially get sicker or die? I mean, it's your choice, but those stigmas are preventing those people, like you said, to even take those services into consideration. And the key word you said in there was education. It's, they're providing education as well. It's not like you go into Planned Parenthood and, and get condoms or birth control and then you leave. It's, it's, they're providing information. Um, I think it was 800,000 pamphlets they made last year just going out about sex education. And again, like I said, the comprehensive sex education they're trying to push for. These educators are going to schools and it was preschool all the way up to collegiate level. So it's age appropriate and we don't have people like that mm -hmm. in our, we don't have health teachers like that um, presenting that information because they might not, um, because of the, you know, the taboo of sex, they might not be presenting that accurate information, that medically accurate information to students. So by having programs that specifically work for research on what is medically accurate, what is up to date, why don't we have those people come into our schools and give presentations, because that's their life, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very important too, the education part. Thanks so much, Kelsey. Okay, I'm going to let Damien put up. I was going to try and get up her PowerPoint as the introducer, but um, I'd like to introduce our next um, speaker. For those that are just joining us, welcome to Scholars Day. Um, and I'm Barb Lisa Boyd, Chair of the session. 
And um, it is with pleasure that I introduce Damien Denner. Damien was enrolled, also enrolled in my sex and culture class in fall 2012. And Damien is a double women and gender studies and chemistry minor, and also a double major in biology and psychology. Pretty impressive. Um, Damien's presentation, Sexual Pleasure, Changing the Conversation, looks at the uneven experience of sexual expression among women and men as a consequence to societal norms, education, and the overall taboo nature of the topic. Damien is a senior who graduates this May, and she is an applicant for graduate studies at Widner University, where she hopes to pursue a master's in sexual health education. Damien is the president of the student-run Voices for Choice, known as Vox. She's very active in the Women and Gender Studies Student Organization and the Sexual Orientation United for Liberation, our Gay Straight Alliance. She is the um, stylist column writer for that. So, Damien. All right, welcome to my presentation. So we are gonna talk about sexual pleasure. So a lot of you are probably thinking, why sexual pleasure? Well, it's very intimate and it's an integral part of our lives. Sex is everywhere, so we can't really avoid it, so we might as well talk about it. And the majority of people are uncomfortable discussing their sexuality, which, you know, if it's so important to us, why can't we talk about it? So my question for you guys is who derives the most pleasure from sex, men or women? You can answer in your head, you don't have to talk. <laughs> so the main problem is in our society, there's a major difference in how men and women experience sexual pleasure. A majority of the time, it's the man's pleasure that matters the most. Now, obviously, this is a very heteronormative view of things. If you have a gay relationship and it's a woman and a woman, a man's pleasure is probably not going to mean too much to either of them. And if it's a man and a man, well, then obviously that would be their priority. So the outline of the presentation today, we're going to talk about sex and sexual pleasure, sex and society, my sex and culture project, and then our campus and the future. So some vocabulary for you guys. I realize this is an uncomfortable, taboo topic, so I wanted to cover some things so you guys don't have to ask questions if you don't want to. Sexual pleasure, physical pleasure derived from sexual contact. The clitoris or clitoris, it's a female organ whose only role is to provide sexual pleasure. And then heteronormativity, a society that implies heterosexuality. So I use this um, example a lot. That would be when you go home and your grandmother's like, oh, do you have a boyfriend? And you're like, I'm a lesbian, so no. Thanks, though, Graham. <laughs> Things like that where everyone just assumes that males and females must naturally pair together, and when they pair together, they're probably going to do it. It's never, like, asexuality is never discussed. Pansexuality is not discussed. It's very much always male-female pairing, and that's how we are, and that's what we talk about. There are gender differences, however. So for men, sexual pleasure typically leads to ejaculation, even though it's not always absolutely that's the path it's going to take. There are many separate phases that we're not going to get into today because it is very, you know, scientific and not exactly what we're talking about with the social construction. But for a lot of the times, men's pleasure is held at a higher esteem because, well, we can't produce without it, right? There is a social pressure for men to initiate. And this isn't just for sexual relations. This is for all sorts of relationships. So have you guys all heard of, like, the Sadie's Hawken, Sadie Hawkins dance? I didn't have one. Is that what it is? Seeing that? Okay, perfect. So that's the dance where the girl has to ask the boy, and it's some big, like, extravagant, whoa, this is out of the norm. What? Because in reality, when we think about relationships, it's the man initiates. A man is the one who's getting on his knees to a, propose to his girlfriend. It's never vice versa. And it's a huge social pressure put on men that I think all the time we think of women as, you know, you're being stigmatized, and it's not fair for women. But it, there also is the flip side where it's not fair for men. I wouldn't want to have to take, you know, three months of my salary to propose to somebody. That's, that's a lot of money, but we expect men to do that. And that's kind of weird. But it also bleeds into their sexual relations where men are expected to initiate sexual encounters or hookups or be the ones that are, you know, conquering as many females as possible. And that's a lot of pressure. Men are the main consumers of Viagra. Who here has heard of Viagra? I'm expecting to see all of your hands because everybody knows what that is. And then on to women, sexual pleasure isn't required to reproduce, so we kind of put it on the back burner. If I get to it, I get to it. It's kind of the, the main 
viewpoint a lot of people have towards sexual pleasure from women, and they are an expected recipient, so if somebody does propose to you, hey, would you like to come back to my place? We expect women more often than not to be like, sure, do you have a lot of resources I could gain from you? Because evolutionarily, that's what you know, it tells us men and women are doing for each other. Men provide women with babies and with resources, and then women provide men with a vessel for babies. There also is a massive hookup culture. In one of the research articles I looked at for this, they talked about hookup cultures for men and women. And for women, they didn't expect themselves to hook up all too much, but they expected other women to be hooking up at a significantly higher rate than they were. And men, it was pretty much even how they would expect themselves to hook up in any sort of so social situation and then how they expect other people. So they think they're, you know, working on par with everybody else, but women expect everybody else to be just a little more apt to hook up, which I thought was very interesting because if everybody else is hooking up more than you are and everybody else thinks that, that doesn't really work out, right? But that's the culture we live in where women are expecting other women to be doing this, but maybe, you know, well, not me, that's not what I do. So we've gone over this. What is this? It's Viagra. It's a little blue pill. What is it used for? Erectile dysfunction in men. What is this? This is uh, methyl testosterone. So it's a steroid. It can be used for women. It's mainly used for men. But when they are treating women with any type of sexual dysfunction disorder, they can prescribe testosterone. And what it does is it increases the testosterone levels in women and with the hopes that it will make sex more desirable and they will be more likely to not necessarily initiate but want to be part of any sort of sexual encounters. But women can also use Viagra. So there have been tests and studies done. The way Viagra works is it dilates the, um, <clears throat> sorry, the cells in the penis, which is what allows the man to sustain a longer erection. And it works the exact same way in the clitoris where it just engorges with blood, gives women and men the exact same effect, but it's a blue pill for men. So there's a huge social construct where if both men and women can use this, why are we only marketing this pill towards men? And why is the FDA only thinking about men when they're creating this pill? And most people don't know what these little pills are. So in terms of advertising, You've all probably seen Viagra commercials, and hopefully we can watch one right now, but maybe not. We'll see if that loads. So Viagra, the most well-known male enhancement drug, receives airtime during primetime hours. If any of you have children, you may have been home around like three o'clock in the afternoon and heard their disclaimer you know, Viagra, Match on the Enhanced Man, you're like, what are you watching? The kid's like, oh, you know, I'm watching normal TV. Oh, that's weird. And the reason is because, you know, sex sells and men are most often the buyer. So we have to cater towards men. There's a definite supply and demand for this, where if men, you know, didn't need, not that they need Viagra, but didn't want to have as much Viagra as they do at the moment, we wouldn't be seeing it in our primetime commercials when most people are at work. Kind of tells you who they're marketing to, people who are most likely at home during the time that these commercials are on. But, and women are neglected and demeaned through these health advertisings because you don't see commercials for women's sexual dysfunction. And there's a lot of reasons why you're not seeing them. For one, because people don't want to talk about it. That's an awkward conversation to have in a classroom, let alone on primetime TV or late night TV even. And the FDA and you know our pharmaceutical companies aren't really investing a lot of their time or energy into making pills or creams or what have you for women who are experiencing any sort of sexual dysfunction. When women do experience sexual dysfunction, it's not known as usually a sexual dysphoria disorder or any sort of sexual dysfunction. They're frigid. Or they are experiencing hysteria. Where for men, we know, oh, if he can't perform, he probably has erectile dysfunction. That's totally common, and it's a medical problem. But for women, when it's, well, you know, she's having trouble, or it's painful for her, well, she's probably frigid, or she's not used to it, or maybe she wasn't prepared enough. Or hysteria, which 
for those of you who don't know, was actually a medical condition where physicians thought the uterus was floating randomly in the body. What? <laughs> but that's what they thought women suffered from when they weren't enjoying sexual intercourse. Like, oh, her, her uterus must be somewhere else right now. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't believe that anymore. But this is one of the major medical interventions that we have a huge problem with in our society. For men, they're experiencing a problem. Okay, let's give you some pills, here's some treatment, and we'll help you on your way so you have a better sex life. For women, oh, I'm experiencing all these problems. Have you thought about therapy? Um, is, it your, is it your partner's problem? Is he not satisfying you? Have you tried exploring by yourself at all? So for women, it's always, it's a mental problem. There must be something wrong with you. I don't have pills for you because this is your own thing that you need to work out. And I think that says a lot with the research we're doing towards women and kind of the interventions that we are prepared to give women who are, are having these problems. And if you know women are, are bearers of children and they're not capable of having sexual intercourse, that's gonna kill a population pretty quickly. But it's not something that you know we're thinking about. So for my sex and culture class, I did some cross-cultural examinations. In the United States, as you guys know, advertisements are catered to men. When we think about sexual pleasure, we think about men and their sexual pleasure and women as the recipients of that sexual pleasure. In France, a lot of their studies also focused on erectile dysfunction, didn't really focus too much on female sexual disorders, it was all on ED. They talked about sex positive cultures, which are cultures in which sexual intercourse is used for pleasure purposes, so not necessarily your cut and dry procreation. And some of the examples that they gave were Islam and Hinduism where they have a more pleasurable view of sex and sexuality. And then sex and negative cultures, which were Christianity culture, so not just you know Western cultures, but anything that was kind of high in their Christianity viewpoints. And the sex negative, it's sex is for procreation. That's what we're here for, that's what we're gonna do. And a majority of the cultures focused on a woman's appearance for male sexual arousal, which they deemed to be a patriarchal social system. So what this means, I realize it's a lot of jargon, is that women are meant to be these beautiful sexual beings that men find attractive. So men can perform. And if women aren't attractive, well then, I will find someone else. Thank you for playing. And what this really means is women are being used for men's sexual arousal in order for men to have sex. And that's not okay, because one, it's demeaning towards women. And for two, then it's using women for men's reasonings. And that's, that's objectification, which we all know is unsafe, <laughs> leads to violence, puts women in dangerous situations, and isn't putting women on an equal playing field with men in terms of sexuality. So for the research I would like to do on this is if other cultures experience the same difference in the value of sexual pleasure, and if that will always be the trend, and finally, who our future sex sexual educators are and how they will discuss this topic because it's uncomfortable to talk about and there are certain things that in a room of people whose education levels you don't know and you don't know how comfortable they are talking about this topic, there are certain things that maybe you don't wanna say or you feel more comfortable leaving out and as a you know sexuality educator, that's really difficult to do because it's hard to talk about some of these topics when you know there are certain hot buttons that you can't say but would definitely get your point across a lot faster. So for our campus, in 2000, I believe it was actually 2009, so this is incorrect. In the spring of 2009, we had on campus the authors of the book, I Love Female Orgasm. It's a sex education book for adults. So yeah, we weren't here for that, I don't believe, which is a bummer. And the entire reasoning for this book is to give both men and women a perspective on what female sexual pleasure is, the best ways to attain it, you know, by yourself, with a partner, however you want to do this. And it gives a great insight into what female sexual pleasure is and why it's so important. And it definitely is not that it leaves men out of the equation, but <coughs> it's great for a college campus because it's an adult perspective that most of us don't get. On our campus currently, like Barb had mentioned, we have Vox, which is Voices for Choice. It's through Planned Parenthood, so everything that Kelsey is talking about. And it's dedicated to reproductive freedoms, campus events and tabling, and they are definitely trying to equal the playing field between men and women. So the overarching themes from this presentation. 
Men's sexual pleasure holds precedence, but things are starting to change due to our DIY guides and speeches. And equality is necessary for every aspect of life, even the most intimate, for full equality to be established between men and women. So even if men and women hold you know, the same jobs and get paid the same, if you know, behind closed doors we're still not equal, then we're not really equal. Bibliography. And you guys have questions? Yeah. Um, you were talking about pills for the women. Mm -hmm. Do you think that women should be getting pills, or do you think maybe men should not be? That is a great question. Uh, I think it definitely depends on the reasoning for the pills. I know there are a lot of people who take Viagra who don't necessarily need it. It's more of like a fun drug. But then there are people who, you know, legitimately do require this for sexual satisfaction. And that's a huge part of our lives is whether or not you can be intimate with somebody really affects your, you know, your depression, your overall sense of self. So in some cases it is extremely important. And I think especially for women knowing that they would have the same, not the exact same options as men, but a very similar, they, there are pharmaceuticals for both people is a definite advantage. If you go online and you Google, you know, anything related to medication, females, and like a sexual dysphoria disorder, it's really hard to find anything. I found that drug in like the very bottom of a WebMD article from like 2010. So it's not widely talked about, and I think if they just had one, just one pill, that people are like, oh yeah, this is something you can use, it might make people feel a little more comfortable about their sexual dysfunctions and see it more normalized, if that makes sense. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And in, in terms of the profits, I think it just shows that we know that men are going to buy into sex more than women, and that is part of the social construction where women aren't supposed to buy into sex. So we know that it's safe to market to men, which is obviously a problem. So, Val, if you want to get your um, presentation, sure. I'll pass on introducing you. So, um, Val, I'd like to introduce Val Smith and. Um, Val was also enrolled in my fall 2012 sex and culture class. Val is a psych major and a women and gender studies minor. She graduates in May um, and she work, right now works in the Office of Career Services here on campus. Um, so Val's presentation, Homosexuality in the DSM-3, a historical overview, joins her interests in women and gender studies with her major in psychology. Here, Val talks about the historical context of homosexuality and gender identity listed in the DSM Manual of Mental Disorders and its changes from the 1950s to the present day. The discussion entails the APA, American Psychiatric Association's original removal of homosexuality diagnosis and what other changes are yet to come. Val. Hi everyone, thank you for being here today. Um, so like Dr. Lisa Boy said, my name is Valerie and I'll be covering just a historical overview of how homosexuality was listed as a mental disorder starting in the 50s and um, the changes that, have, that we've seen since then and then the changes we have yet to see in the future. So the DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. 
This was originally created in 1952 by the American uh, Psychiatric Association. This provides a common language and standard criteria for the classification of mental disorders. So it's created to define and organize disorders and give mental health professionals uh, guidelines to treat the illnesses that are listed in the DSM. So the definition of a mental disorder is a clinically significant behavioral or psychological syndrome or pattern that occurs in an individual which is associated with present distress or disability or with a significant increased risk of suffering. So why was homosexuality listed as a mental disorder? Mental disorders in the DSM are, are categorized in the manual because an individual is, is experiencing personal distress in their lives. Um, also experiencing maladaptiveness and deviation from social norms. So homosexuality doesn't necessarily meet these requirements. Many individuals are satisfied and show no impairment or um, social effectiveness or in their functioning. They, they don't experience that. Unless, of course, brought upon by society where bullying um, or discrimination come into effect, uh, which is a big problem in today's society, bullying and um, discrimination against people's sexual identity. So just to give you some dates and little timeline of homosexuality in the DSM, uh, like I said, originally in 1952, it was labeled as a sociopathic personality disorder. This means it's an axis two of the DSM. Um, in 1968, this was switched from the sociopathic list, but then categorized with other sexual deviations. So in 1973, about 10,000 psychiatrists voted on its removal. Um, You'll see that 58% of the, these psychiatrists supported this removal, um, but in order to calm the, the opponents who didn't support that, they changed it to sexual orientation disturbance. Um, you'll see it later on too, we'll, we'll discuss how this means that it was only problematic if it was dissatisfi dissatisfying to the individual. Um, so in 1974, the seventh printing uh, replaced the diagnosis with category of uh, sexual orientation disturbance. Um, in 1980, you'll see egodystonic homosexuality. This is indicated by an individual's lack of heterosexual arousal or distress from unwanted arousal. Um, in 1986, I'm sorry, 1986, uh, it was switched to sexual disorders not otherwise specified, so a little more um, generic, as well as um, 1994, in the DSM-4, you'll see the additions keep changing. We even have one coming out next month. Um, and since 1994, it's listed in there as gender identity disorder. So we'll kind of touch on how sexual identity relates to gender identity, um, and we'll look at that relation. So while it was listed as a mental disorder, um, clients were subjected to a variety of treatments aimed to cure what was considered a condition. One of the most popular um, therapies was aversion therapy, and this is the use of unpleasant stimuli to eliminate undesirable behavior. So for example, an individual who identified as a lesbian would be shown a photo of an attractive woman and then injected a chemical that would make her physically ill. So it's almost training your body to repulse it, almost. Um, also popular electric shock therapy, brain surgery, and even castration. So we could just imagine what these individuals were labeled as and what they had to go through um, because of their sexual identity and their orientation. Um, so we'll see uh, throughout the removal, many things changed this, many things related to it. Um, sexual revolution, civil rights movements, people were, people were more, becoming more comfortable with their identity, people were coming out, um, in turn discouraged the treatment and the research, especially because these treatments were so unethical um, that they failed to identify causes and cures. People notice that this is just an unethical situation and it's not producing any result. Um, also to eliminate social discrimination of a sick stigma, these individuals were labeled by having a mental disorder. Um, and we could just imagine how um, terrible that would be. So the DSM-5 is actually being published next month. Um, and this is where it will become gender dysphoria will still be listed in the DSM. Uh, this displays a marked incongruence between one's experienced and expressed gender and assigned gender. 
So in a way, it's, it almost confuses people because it's not your sexual orientation, but it's being listed as what you identify with, um, you know, a male or a female. Today, the APA states that psychologists, psychiatrists, and other mental health professionals agree that homosexuality is not an illness, a mental disorder, or an emotional problem. Homosexuality was once thought to be a mental illness because mental health professionals in society had biased information. And many of us will view this biased information as either homophobia um, or ignorance. So what I'm interested in, in looking into in the future, too, is the pressures on uh, the diagnosis, what it meant for these individuals to be labeled uh, with a mental disorder. Um, a question that kind of stems from that, is it more acceptable for an, an individual struggling with their, you know, their place in the world, is it more acceptable for them to have that label or with more rights? Um, which could be kind of confusing. But in a way, it means if you're labeled as something, is, does it make it more okay? Um, instead of giving you other situations. Um, so stresses of sexual pre uh, prejudice, more specific cases, how it really influenced um, generations throughout the time. Um, and then again, like I said, orientation versus identity. Um, relative, but confusing. Um, and, and in a way, like if you, you can see that we've come so far, but we're, we still realize that there are only nine states that recognize same-sex marriage. That's only about 15% of our nation. Um, and coming from the time that it was from, realized as a mental disorder, it's, it's a great step. Um, but when, if you're um, updated too with, with media, we have a lot of things to work on. So, any questions or comments? Yeah. Saddening, <laughs> really terrible. Absolutely. Did we have a question in the back? I don't want to forget about you. Yeah. No, I was going to say, um, when you had, like, for your further research as far as looking into you know, the better to be in the DSM versus the system, mm -hmm. kind of seen as natural mm -hmm. in life, I think that it is kind of, it would, I think having it in the DSM, I think knowing that you Definitely. And people mm -hmm. definitely associate that with being bad. Right, it's problematic. That, um, it, it's better to just remove it altogether. Right. As society kind of becomes mm -hmm. stuff, stuff, mm -hmm. just to understand and accept it as a yes. sexuality. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I, I'm very pleased to see the change of uh, its removal. And um, like I said, we still have progress to, to overcome. Um, I absolutely agree with you. Thank you, everyone. So our last presenter today, Beth Clark, and again, Beth was enrolled in my politics and culture class. Beth is a journalism and broadcasting major with a minor in theater.